Serving as the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada, economist Stephen Polaz steered monetary policy through some turbulent times under prime ministers from different parties and as Brexit and U.S. President Donald Trump shook up the international economic order. It's not a leap then to see where his interest came in writing his new book. It's called The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future. And Stephen Polos joins us now from the nation's capital for more. Governor, do I still call you Governor? Well, how about I just call you Mr. Polos? Welcome to TVO. It's good to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, let's just start with the intro of the book right off the top here, because you do write that economic forecasting is a bit like driving a car that is in such disrepair that all you can say is that it's probably going to move forward, but there's also a chance it'll suddenly veer to the left or to the right. I think we all mm -hmm. know that feeling. Tell us then, why is it so difficult to make economic forecasts that are accurate? Well, uh, the, the economic system is in incredibly complex, Steve. Um, the models that economists use to try to reduce it down to something that they can understand and manage are huge abstractions. They really don't capture the kind of details uh, that we need. And so they, they work for a while. They work until they don't, basically, until something else happens that's not really in the model. And of course, in fact, that's happening all the time. So I've always been a bit of a skeptic when it comes to forecasting. I was a forecaster myself for many years. And so I always treated it with enough skepticism that I knew there was going to be many more possibilities. And so like weather forecasters, uh, economists, I think, over time are going to drift into a world where they use more than one model, which emphasize completely different things, and then generate more of a cloud of possibilities for the future. You talk about um, that's a bunch how of weather forecasts. Sorry, weather forecasters have become extremely good at their craft. You may have noticed that they're like to the hour, and that's because of this uh, this change in methodology. Right. You you um, you talk in the book about tectonic forces that are you know sort mm -hmm. of shaking up the world and making it very difficult to do the job that you guys do. What are the tectonic forces as you look at the world today that you're most concerned about? Well, these things are things we all know about. For example, population aging. Uh, it can't be it can't be more practical than that. Uh, population aging is always there, but it's really aging fast now because 50 years ago, back after the post-war period, what we had was a really rapid increase in people. Those people are now retiring. Technological progress, which is there all the time, but it goes in these big waves. We've had three major waves in, in human history three industrial revolutions, and we believe we're on it's just beginning a new one, which is the, the move to in, in, in artificial intelligence and uh, digitalization of everything we do. Growing income inequality is my third major force. This is, always comes hand in hand with technological change, and we see plenty of evidence of that today. Rising debt, we've talked about that for the past number of years, but of course it exploded during the pandemic, especially government debt. And so we have a legacy there, which is, creates a force which will be continued to act uh, throughout the future. And the one everybody's talking about is climate change. Climate change, uh, of course, is now producing this uh, forced transition between now and 2050. And that will be a whole layer of structural uncertainty on the economy. Now, each of these things is a personal thing, Steve. Each one of those things has personal effects. Anything that matters to people matters to politicians. And what that does, it means that the, those issues become political issues. And what happens then is they tend to polarize people. People have very strong views about some of these things. Some feel they, they've been left out. Political polarization always comes with rising income inequality and technological change, and it makes it really hard for governments to make decisions. Well, and then just when you think you, you may have those tectonic shifts figured out, Vladimir Putin decides to invade his neighbor, and that sends economic forces completely kaflui. How do we figure all indeed. that out? Well, indeed. I mean, that's, uh, that's kind of a reminder, if you like, that we actually are surrounded by, by fragilities, whether they're economic, financial, or geopolitical. Uh, some of those could be completely off the charts, uh, sort of a black swan, even though you might have seen the Russian-Ukraine thing coming, of course, when it actually happens, like an earthquake, it's, it's totally unpredictable when it happens. So uh, when it does happen, it creates these, these ripples throughout the system, which will go on for a very long time. 
And, uh, and we are not really that well prepared to deal with risk. I believe that these tectonic forces we've talked about, which of course, as I said, layer up into politics and geopolitics, those forces are gonna combine and magnify one another in unpredictable ways, things that our models will not be able to handle. And those, un those ev events of unpredictability are things like major outbursts of inflation or depressions in the past, which the same forces produced. Uh, so I think we're in for more and more volatility as a result of this, and we are not well prepared for it. It's an interesting thing that, that your job, when you had it at the Bank of Canada, and of course your successor's job, is, is hugely important to the economic success of the country and to every single Canadian, uh, you know, who's trying to make a living these days and trying to keep their head above water. And yet my hunch is, well, you, you described an incident in the book where, where uh, you're on an airplane and a flight attendant looks at you and says, uh, so who replaced that, uh, that old guy at the Bank of Canada anyway? And you had to tell her <laughs> it was you because yeah. you, you, you do your job in, in almost, I mean, I'm going to guess that 98% of the people couldn't identify you when you had the job as governor of the Bank of Canada. Do you think mm -hmm. it's a problem that we know so little about the bank, about its mission, about the people who perform that mission? What do you think? Not really. You know, I, I think if, if when we're doing it well and the system is reacting in the way we predict, it's actually a good thing. Uh, you know, you shouldn't have to worry about what's going on at the Bank of Canada, and you won't, provided everything's going fine. Um, and part of going fine means that the, the Bank of Canada is doing its job, reacting to volatility and smoothing things out, uh, because those are the consequences for people. So I always believe that uh, the ideal situation would be when people could just forget all about it, that the, the central bank's taking care of business. And of course, the, the central banker is out there reminding people what they do, communicating the issues to people, which I think is very important. It's important that people understand what they face and what risks they face, and so they're better prepared for them. So that's an important mission of the central bank. But I don't think it needs to be, you know, a fame, a fame thing and, you know, on the TV every day and all that. Uh, but, of course, when a crisis happens, that's exactly what happens. Well, let's talk about that mission a little bit then. One of your mandates, as you've explained it, obviously, is to make sure that you take a lot of the, the shocks out of the economy, that you try to keep inflation at a relatively even level. Target mm -hmm. is 2%. Maximum employment is also part of your mission. But inflation in the country is currently at 5%. Mm -hmm. And... If you've got this whole infrastructure of economists and advisors and so on at the Bank of Canada, whose job it is to keep inflation at 2%, and you guys were, you know, pretty good at it for several decades in a row there, how did it get to five? <laughs> well, you know, it always sounds easier than it really is. Uh, it almost sounds mechanical to people. Uh, you see inflation go up, you do something to make it go back down. But in fact, there's actually a pretty long lag between when a central bank takes an action and when it shows up in inflation. Uh, usually, actually, one and a half years or perhaps as long as two years between when the bank moves interest rates and when inflation actually reacts. So that means you can't, you can't, uh, essentially, you would be looking in the rearview mirror and driving your car, uh, you know, to be reacting to inflation today. What you have to do is look forward and say, well, what's inflation going to be two years from now? Oh, is it going to be too high? That means I need to raise interest rates today to offset that and make sure it doesn't become too high. Well, that re relies on a really good forecast of the economy, which is subject to the vagaries we just discussed. It is a really hard job. Uh, there are many, many things between an interest rate movement and its ultimate effect on inflation. And each of those relationships is just something that we model on average and any day or any month that could behave differently than in the past. So I don't, I, you shouldn't think of it as a really easy job. Now, how did it get to 5%? Well, many of that's kind of, those things are kind of accidental, Steve. I mean, the fact is that when we, when we hit the, uh, the pandemic, prices began to fall. We were at a risk of deflation. When deflation interacts with high debt, that's where depressions come from. That was a very real risk in the, in the middle of that pandemic. Offsetting that was a major success. When it's all over, then you're kind of mopping up, you know, like a firefighter has done their job, then they clean up. Well, afterwards, then what happens is things go back to normal. So prices went down, then they went back up. So it looks like inflation as they go back up. 
Supply chain issues emerged, that was unexpected, that adds to pricing, and then of course oil prices recovered and more than recovered, and so that adds to inflation. So some of these things are unpredictable, many of them should be transitory, and so I'm expecting inflation to decelerate throughout 2022. We'll have to see. You've got that nice analogy in your book about firefighting, which you just uh, alluded to a second ago, which is yeah. no one ever blames a firefighter for using too much water if at the end of the day you save the house. Okay, yeah. same situation for you. Can you give us an analogy of something that you might have done when you were the governor of the bank that you might have been criticized by some for, for being too interventionist, and yet at the end of the day, maybe you saved the purchasing power for 36 million Canadians in a way that they probably don't even know? Well, that's, you know, that's what central banking is about. As I said before, you just think, well, if it works out, then I don't ask any questions about it. But what you realize is when, when monetary policy is working perfectly, interest rates are going up and down to prevent something from happening. And therefore, they look like they're going up and down for no apparent reason. And that's what makes it really hard to explain to people. Uh, so the one episode that really stands out in my mind was, uh, was when oil prices collapsed. Uh, in late 2014 and into early 2015. Uh, and a lot of people were arguing about whether that would be good or bad for the Canadian economy. And at the bank, we were convinced it would be quite negative for the Canadian economy. And just to underscore it, we phoned uh, the major companies in the sector. Simple, simple. Don't look up at the data, just to ask people, what are you going to do now that oil prices have collapsed? So we knew how much investment was going to shrink uh, during that year. So we knew we needed to act, and we acted quickly, almost preemptively, to put a cushion under the, the economy. And I think that sped up the economy's adjustment process quite well. And so I consider that a success. But at the time, uh, I, I did take some criticism for it, just because you know it was unexpected, and it seemed like you were kind of uh, reacting in a way that, well, no one was really predicting it. So in the end turned out fine, uh, and that feels good, because that means the forecasters did a great job of that. But then in the end, it wasn't really the models, it was those phone calls. Hmm. We like charts on this program. You like charts in your old job. So let's share one with our viewers and listeners right now. This is a chart that shows household wealth distribution in Canada in the fourth quarter of 2020. So the pandemic has already hit and has been on, as it were, for several months. And uh, just for those who are listening on podcast and can't see the chart, let me describe the fact that about two-thirds uh, of the household wealth is held among the top 20% in Canada. The middle 40% have 30%, so disproportionately less. And the bottom 40% have only 2.5% of the household mm -hmm. wealth in the country. Now, uh, obviously, I don't know if this was your intention at the Bank of Canada, but do you think the Bank of Canada recognizes the role that it did play, along with other central banks, in potentially helping the wealthiest among us get even wealthier over the last few years that this pandemic has been a scourge in our lives. Yeah, so uh, for sure that what's behind uh, that chart is mostly housing. Uh, that the the, four, the bottom 40% are those people who do not uh, own uh, any any real estate and therefore did not benefit from the rise in real estate prices. There are, of course, also stocks and uh, other investments which are also concentrated at the top, also uh, things that went up in price during the pandemic. Uh, that means that wealth went up, uh, you know, for the economy as a whole, but it's concentrated in those who actually hold uh, those kinds of assets. And I understand that. Um, I'm often asked about this, frankly, and, um, and so I ask, well, what is at the root of that? Well, people say, well, it's because you cut interest rates really low, basically to zero, and that caused this to happen. And I say, yeah, but why did I cut interest rates uh, to zero? Well, because I was trying to protect the economy from the second Great Depression. Now, if we asked ourselves, what would happen if we didn't do those things? Uh, the metaphor I like to use is if you go to your doctor and he says, Steve, you need you need uh, surgery, otherwise you're going to die. He said, well I, well, I guess we'll do the surgery, but is it going to hurt? And the doctor says, well, of course it's going to hurt, but it'll save your life. Well, okay, now let's look at this. We're going to have the second Great Depression if we do nothing. We do what we do, and of course it has side effects, just like the pain from the surgery. And those side effects are things like income and wealth distribution get affected during that transition. 
That's a price we have to pay in order to offset that major disturbance, which could have affected everybody. In the Great Depression, you know, 30% unemployment and, uh, and so on. Okay, these are really bad ep episodes in our history and better policymaking prevents them. But it, it does produce side effects, which I understand, but those are second order issues compared to the big one. And I presume it's also your position that there are governments that are certainly within their rights to take decisions which would bevel the edges of the effects of your policy decisions. Is that fair to say? Exactly right. You're, you're asking a fiscal question, mm -hmm. uh, which would be a democratically supported uh, policy, which, uh, which addresses these issues. Canada has a good progressive income tax system. And in fact, uh, out of you know something like 70% of the global the world's citizens have seen a, de uh, a deterioration in income distribution, okay, in, in income inequality over the last 10 years. But Canada is not among them. Canada has actually improved its income distribution uh, in the last six, seven years. Well, well, okay, that's that's income as opposed to what you are addressing as wealth, which is which is a sharper edge. But in all those the cases, it is about uh, the government's fiscal policy, which has the power to redistribute income. <clears throat> excuse me, in ways you know, making a more progressive tax system or one-time tax changes in order to uh, adjust this. I uh, just to remind you that one of the forces I talked about as as the the fourth industrial revolution. Rising income inequality always comes with a major uptick in technology. So it's going to be a trend line, not just a situation. And this is a global trend line. It's going to be something that income inequality will be on a rising trend uh, over the next five to 10 years, unless we make something different in our policies in order to, uh, to correct some of that, as you say, around the edges. I know you're a fan of Downton Abbey, that great British television program, because you mention it so often in your book. And um, it sort of reminded me of the time, I think almost a decade ago, that we had the American writer and academic Michael Lind on our program talking about the future of work. Here's a clip of what he had to say then, and then we'll come back and chat about what he had to say. Sheldon, if you would. What we're seeing uh, in the United States and in other developed countries is most of the jobs being created are in non-traded domestic service jobs, many of them fairly uh, poorly paid, uh, nursing aides, for example, uh, uh, or uh, uh, janitors, uh, daycare uh, personnel. Uh, it is a political question whether these jobs, which cannot be automated and cannot be outsourced, uh, pay middle class wages or not. And, okay. and uh, different societies uh, organize themselves differently. So you can have one country in the 21st century where it has a sort of Downton Abbey class hierarchy where most of the people are servants for a few rich owners of the robot factories. You could have another social democratic country where the people who are the working poor in a country like the United States, uh, say the nursing aides, uh, have, are, are part of a prosperous middle class. Do you think Canada is headed towards a Downton Abbey style of society? Uh, well, that's a pretty, that's a pretty uh, deep question, but I do think, as I've just said, that the trend that will come with the fourth industrial revolution will exaggerate the uh, income inequality that we see today. The reason that happens is because when you have a new technology, economists think of new technology spreading to everybody like yeast. Uh, but what it actually looks like is more like mushrooms, okay? The, 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 the benefits from the technology pop up and the companies that invented the technology or deployed it first can, can grab the mushrooms. But importantly, the second round is when the, the, the people who make out uh, well uh, in that first phase begin to spend their money. And what that does is it creates jobs across not just the new sector, not just in the sectors just mentioned in the clip, but across all sectors. So take, for instance, you know, you continue to buy more houses because people have more incomes. Well, as you buy more houses, that creates all kinds of jobs in the service sector that are well paid, plumbers, electricians, uh, furnace technicians, you name it, anything related to the home, uh, those jobs all continue to grow. Now, will anybody believe me when they say, and I say well, that new job for the, that person who renovates your kitchen is being created because of the new technology? It seems like a stretch to think of it that far away, but I assure you that is exactly what happens. So in the end, yes, uh, when you have this uh, increasing disparity in incomes, there are more than one way to, to tackle it. 
things like guaranteed basic incomes, you know, those, those kinds of things, or as the as the clip suggested, possibly a higher minimum wage uh, for those folks who are doing essential work. Uh, I think what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years is there's going to be a shortage of workers, Steve. But I do think that the power in the marketplace is going to shift from employer to employee. And so we will see better compensation and we'll see a, a wider range of types of compensation that helps people address the risks that they face in everyday life. Well, let me pick up on the housing comment that you just made, because, of course, by keeping interest rates as low as you did over the past many years, you did allow people who were able to to get into the housing market in a major way, uh, which sent, of course, housing prices through the roof. And now, you know, we've got a situation where lots of millennials and Gen Z say, we'll never get into the housing market until our parents die and leave us some money. Do you think that's a, like, is that a reasonable policy prescription for the Bank of Canada and or the government of Canada to take that a whole generation of people are gonna have to depend on their parents dying before they can get into the housing market? Well, you put it in a, in a very uh, severe way, but I would say, uh, first of all, it goes back to that uh, metaphor I used before, which is when you cut interest rates in order to buffer the effects of a, a major shock to the economy, your hope is that those lower interest rates will cause people to actually borrow and spend money, both companies, perhaps an investment. That's hard to do in the middle of a recession or, or a contraction of the economy. But the other major transmission channel is housing, that regular uh, people who have been waiting some, to someday buy a house accelerate those plans because of those lower interest rates. So it is literally a planned part of the transmission mechanism to try to boost the economy in certain sectors while other sectors are suffering to try to, to ride out uh, that, that decline. So it's intended. Now, you know, you can afterwards say, well, we wish it didn't happen quite like that. But since it had to happen, it had to happen in that way. Uh, is it right? Well, uh, in the end, uh, what I think is going to happen is that, yes, you're right that accessibility of housing is becoming a problem in many of our major cities. Uh, I understand that perfectly. So what ha does happen? Is it the case that people can only rent and hope and wait until someday mom and dad leave them the house uh, that may be a life plan for some people others uh, may find other ways we may have financial innovation we may find lenders who are willing to um, co-own houses with people we may have companies who are willing to make housing or housing risk part of their compensation policies so lots of innovation can happen in the economy but especially financial intermediation. Right now, we still have a kind of a depression mentality around housing. You're supposed to have a big down payment. You're supposed to take 25 or 30 years to pay for your house, and then you own it, and then you retire. Uh, well, you know, if the house is $1.5 million as opposed to $500,000, those two plans don't look the same to the average worker. And that's what happens, say, between a place like Moncton versus Toronto, just to take an example. Mm -hmm. So what we need is, is investors who are prepared to allow those folks in Toronto to own a share of their home while the investor owns the rest of the home. And then, and then they can build up the same amount of equity as the family down in Moncton. I think that that's the sort of life plan we should be able to achieve. We have the best banking system on earth. Do you think, though, that we're in a, just one more on this housing issue, do you think we're into a perpetual situation whereby the Bank of Canada, for reasons you've explained, completely understandable, has put forward a, a policy, an interest rate policy that has resulted in the housing market going through the roof. And you've now got politicians who are trying to come up with housing programs that give access to people who can't get into the housing market, an ability to do so, and they're never really successfully able to keep up, right? There's lots of housing policy programs out there, and they just don't seem to be able to do the job because the market forces yeah. are so tough otherwise. Is this a cycle yeah. we're into for the foreseeable future? I don't think so, uh, because what you've just laid out is a premise that it's all because of low interest rates, and I think it isn't. Uh, if it is because of low interest rates, then as interest rates uh, move back to a more normal level over the next, I don't know, year or two, well, that will unwind some of the effect that you're talking about. But I think the most important thing that's pushed housing prices higher has been excess demand for houses. 
we are having over 400,000 people, new people arriving in Canada every year and not building enough dwellings for them to live in. This is going to be, push up prices uh, all perpetually if, if that's our growth model, which I fully expect it will be. Well, so as identified the Ontario Task Force on, on housing that was just published a couple of weeks ago, the most important thing is going to happen here is we need to boost supply of housing. And that means addressing things like red tape or other zoning restrictions. Uh, in order to uh, improve that supply, there's a ready market there. So developers surely would be ready to do this. They will make money. Uh, people will get their housing aspirations fulfilled. This can be done. Uh, but we need to get our sleeves rolled up and fix the rule book uh, around housing for to have any hope that supply will meet demand. But even if supply met demand perfectly, Steve, I just want to remind everybody that the price of existing homes would still keep going up all the time. As cities get bigger, what happens is you get a little further from the center, a little further from the center. Time is money. You got to get on in your car or on the bus or whatever it is you do to get downtown. Well, you're always going to be willing to pay just a little more to be a little closer. Okay, so the bigger a city gets, the more expensive it becomes. That is mother nature at work. Um, and so we do need to explore every one of these possibilities in order to solve this for as a society. Let me ask you one last question, and that is, I know from having read the book that you love President Jed Bartlett, who unfortunately <laughs> is not a real guy. That's who Martin Sheen played in the West Wing. Do yeah. you see... Any politician out there, male or female, who, who's got the Bartlett qualities that you think could really make a great contribution to our society? Well, Jed Bartlett is written as a perfect yet fallible character. So he's a very human character. Uh, it's, he's masterfully written. Uh, and that's why there's so many, I think, leadership lessons for people who are, are, want to be leaders, who are our leaders. The same thing with Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation. So let's just set that aside for a moment. Do we have that sort of ideal reader? Of course not. That's, that's, what's, that's, that's made up. Uh, do I see signs of that? In, at times. At times when, when things happen, you think, now that's what I've been watching for. But generally speaking, no. I'm afraid that our, our political class is, is, I think politics is the hardest job on earth, Steve. You know, it, it looks hard on the West Wing, but in real life, my goodness, I've seen it up close. It is the most difficult job there is. And it's going to get harder as that polarization increases, which is being driven by economic factors. Uh, so I don't, I'm not confident that we're going to find it so, you know, like on TV, to get these compromises worked out and get the job done. I think in the end, uh, the residual uncertainty that we face, we're going to face it ourselves and our companies will face it. That's Stephen Polas, the ninth governor of the Bank of Canada, author of The Next Age of Uncertainty, How the World Can Adapt to a Riskier Future. And, Governor, it's been good of you to join us here on TVO tonight. Many thanks. My pleasure. Thanks, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.